Funding for this program was provided in part by Religious Education at Brigham Young University. This address by Dr. Joseph F. McConkie was given at the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium at Brigham Young University on October 29, 2005. The Smith family and a tradition of revelation. The basic thesis that I would like to uh, suggest to you this morning is that uh, when the hearts of the children turn to the fathers, the hearts of the fathers turn to the children, and then the fathers convey upon the children the blessings that were theirs. Now, uh, you and I have uh, a privilege not known to earlier members of the church in that we can ascend at Mount Zion and uh, with the vantage point of both time and history turn and overlook a magnificent uh, panoramic view and gain knowledge and understanding from that vision, if you will, that uh, others cannot. We see what they could not see. And so uh, my invitation to you is as uh, we sit there and as we look at the marvelous heritage and past that we have as a people, that this morning we take a look at uh, the Smith family by that I mean Joseph Smith, his uh, father, Joseph Sr., uh, his mother Lucy Mack, his wife Emma, and then uh, his siblings. And that uh, as we uh, watch the experiences that were theirs over the course of time, we center our attention on uh, those things that teach us how the spirit of revelation was operative in their family. And then uh, we uh, take the lessons that uh, we learn and uh, we uh, find application of those lessons in our own families. I think the first family of Mormonism constitute a marvelous case study for that particular purpose. Now, I would like to take two scriptural texts as, uh, a, a, to, to establish a background for the principles that I would like to unfold. The first is found in the 25th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, a revelation given by the prophet to uh, his wife, uh, Emma Smith in July of 1830. So we are now just a matter of uh, a few months since the church was organized. The revelation begins in this manner. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God while I speak unto you, Emma Smith, my daughter. Now pause for a moment. Wouldn't it be a marvelous thing if uh, a woman, you had the Lord address you by name and then uh, identify you as his daughter, Emma Smith, my daughter. For verily I say unto you, all those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. A revelation I give unto you, to con you concerning my will. And if thou art faithful and walk in the paths of virtue before me, I will preserve thy life, and thou shalt receive an inheritance in Zion. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady whom I have called. Now, instruction that is specific to her situation. 
is then given, and the revelation concludes with this language. Wherefore, lift up thy heart and rejoice and cleave unto the covenants which thou hast made. Continue in the spirit of meekness. Beware of pride. Let thy soul delight in thy husband and the glory which shall come upon him. Keep my commandments continually and a crown of righteousness thou shalt receive. And except thou do this where I am, you cannot come. And verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my voice unto all. Amen. Now, what took place then in this revelation was that the Lord addressed himself specifically and particularly to Emma Smith and uh, announces that she is his daughter. But then in turn, as the revelation concludes, he invites Emma Smith to take the blessing that is hers and share it with all faithful women. And so the revelation concludes with the language, and this is my voice unto all, all who will live worthy of it, all whose hearts, if you will, are one with Emma. Uh, that's a marvelous promise. And so that uh, is, in effect, you, uh, the Lord addressing you by name, and announcing that you are his daughter. Now, one other text that I would like to take as a background as uh, we get this panoramic view, and that would come from uh, the uh, third section of the Doctrine and Covenants. You'll immediately remember that the context of this revelation is uh, the loss of the 116 pages. This is where uh, Joseph Smith is rebuked by the Lord. The uh, key text to which I call your attention is the fourth verse, which reads, For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets it not the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. Now, that is uh, an announcement that uh, all the revelations in the world cannot excuse the necessity of obedience. We cannot say, because I've had a particular spiritual experience, that I have been saved. Salvation is only found in uh, our obedience to all the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Now, uh, with the, the invitation then to uh, take the blessings given to the Smith family, and with the invitation to be wise in the boundaries that the Lord has set on the principle of revelation, let's look at some of the kind of experiences that they have. I would like to begin the story in the year 1803. This would be two years before the birth of Joseph. In the setting of uh, the occasion, uh, Lucy has been uh, in uh, uh, conversation with her husband. He is somewhat frustrated. He inherited an attitude from his father, Asel Smith that uh, he ought to be somewhat suspicious of organized religion. Lucy was anxious that the family be involved in that kind of experience. She didn't argue with her husband. What she did was as follows. I retired to a grove of handsome wild cherry trees, not far distant, and prayed to the Lord that he would influence the heart of my husband, that it might be softened so as to receive the true gospel whenever it was preached, or that he might become more religiously inclined. I leave that experience and invite you in our panoramic view to step back now with some years. Uh, William Smith, her next youngest son uh, in the later years, has asked the question about the religious practices of the uh, family interviewer, 
Were your folks religiously inclined before Joseph saw the angel? William, yes. We always had family prayers since I can remember. I well remember father used to carry his spectacles in his vest pocket. And when we boys saw him fill for his specs, we knew that was a signal to get ready for prayer. And if we did not notice it, mother would say, William, or whoever was the negligent one, get ready for prayers. Now I might note that you don't have to put your glasses on to pray. So the fact that he was reaching for his specs would suggest to us that uh, prayer was accompanied by scriptural reading. William also tells us that afterwards the family would sing a song together. Now, in time, I zero you in on a particular instance once again. The year is 1830. The Smiths have just returned from a visit to Fayette where they were at the Whitmer home on the occasion of which the three witness had, witnesses had the privilege of seeing the angel Moroni and the plates. They've now returned to Palmyra. Lucy recounts as follows. We returned home the next day a cheerful, happy little company. In a few days, we were followed by Joseph Oliver and the Whitmers, who came to make us a visit and make some arrangements about getting the book printed. Soon after they came, all the male part of the company with my husband, now that would be uh, in this instance, uh, four Whitmers and uh, Hiram Page. Hiram had married into the family. So uh, that uh, uh, group of five, with her husband, her son Samuel, and her son Hiram, retired. Now I want you to note this language very carefully. To a grove where the family was in the habit of offering up their secret devotions to God. Now it is family habits of which I speak. It is family traditions of which I speak. With the Smiths, sacred groves were a tradition. When the youthful Joseph went into what we call the sacred grove, he followed a well-trod path of righteous family tradition to a place well known to his family. Now, uh, all the experiences that uh, follow uh, seem to uh, sustain that pattern. I return you to the year 1803 in the story we commenced, where Lucy went out to her grove to pray about uh, her husband's uh, attitude toward uh, organized religion. She uh, prayed fervently, returned home, and that night dreamed as follows. I thought that I stood in a large and beautiful meadow, which lay a short distance from the house in which we lived, and that everything around me wore an aspect of uh, pleasant peculiarness. The first thing that attracted my special attention in this magnificent meadow was a very pure and clear stream that ran through the midst of it. And as I traced this stream, I discovered two trees standing on its margin, both of which were on the same side of the stream. These trees were very beautiful. They were well proportioned and towered with majestic beauty to a great height. Their branches, which added to their symmetry and glory, commenced near the top and spread themselves in luxurious grandeur around. I gazed upon them with wonder and admiration, and after beholding them a short time, I saw one of them was surrounded with a bright belt that shone like, a, like burnished gold, but far more brilliantly. Presently, a gentle breeze passed by, and the tree, encircled with this golden zone, bent gracefully before the wind and waved its beautiful branches in the light air. As the wind increased, this tree assumed the most lively and animated appearance and seemed to express in its motions the utmost joy and happiness. If it had been an intelligent creature, 
It could not have conveyed by the power of language the idea of joy and gratitude so perfectly as it did. And even the stream that rolled beneath it shared apparently every sensation felt by the tree. For as the branches danced over the stream, it would swell gently and then recede again with a motion as soft as the breathing of an infant, but as, <coughs> the, but as lively as the dancing of a sunbeam. The belt also partook of the same influence, and as it moved in unison with the motion of the stream and of the tree, it increased continually in refulgence and magnitude until it became exceedingly glorious. I turned my eyes upon its fellow, which stood opposite, but it was not surrounded with the belt of light as the former. It stood erect and fixed as a pillar of marble. No matter how strong the wind blew over it, not a leaf was stirred, not a bough was bent, but obstinately, obstinately stiff it stood, scorning alike the zephyr's breath or the power of the mighty storm. I wondered at what I saw and said in my heart, what can be the meaning of all of this? And the interpretation was given me. <clears throat> that these personated my husband and his oldest brother, Jesse. That the stubborn and unyielding tree was like Jesse, and that the other more pliant and flexible was like Joseph, my husband. That the breath of heaven which passed over them was the pure and undefiled gospel of the Son of God, which gospel Jesse would always resist, but which Joseph, when he was more advanced in life, would hear and receive with his whole heart and rejoice therein, and unto him would be added intelligence, happiness, glory, and everlasting life. Now I bring you forward in time. The year is 1834. Joseph and Hiram are involved on what we call Zion's Camp. This was a march of brethren from uh, the area of Kirtland out to uh, Independence, Missouri to offer uh, help to beleaguered saints there. You know the story and you know that in every instance their behavior was not that which would be expected of an army of the Lord. Joseph had called them to task. They had uh, reformed their behavior for short periods, but uh, not consistently. He had warned that the Lord would rebuke them. Upon their arrival, a cholera broke out among them. Joseph and Hiram were immediately called to lay hands on their brethren. In doing so, they too were stricken with the disease. They uh, made hand signals to each other, made immediate to retreat from the house in which uh, they were, to seek uh, seclusion in some quiet grove, to pray that God would deliver them from uh, the awful influence of this disease. But they hardly had the strength to stand. They knelt in prayer and asked the Lord what they could do. They were stricken the more. They prayed again and found no relief. Finally, they agreed that they would continue to pray one after another until they could get to some kind of communication with the Lord. They did this for some time, and then Hiram sprang to his feet and exclaimed, Joseph, I have seen an open vision in which I saw, note it well, mother on her knees under an apple tree praying for us. And she is even now asking God in tears to spare our lives that she may behold us again in the flesh. From that moment, they began to be healed. Oh, my mother, said Joseph, how often have your prayers been a means of assisting us when the shadows of death encompassed us. Now I call your attention to Joseph Smith Sr., my third great-grandfather. 
Around 1811, the years just before and thereafter, he was blessed with a series of uh, dreams, seven in number, his wife said. She recorded three, uh, five of them. <clears throat> Let me share one here this morning. I was alone, he said, in a gloomy desert, with the exception of an attendant spirit who kept constantly by my side. Of him I inquired the meaning of what I saw and why I was thus traveling in such a dismal place. He answered thus, This field is the world which now lieth inanimate and dumb in regard to true religion or the plan of salvation. But travel on. And by the wayside you will find on a certain box, a log a box, the contents of which, if you eat thereof, will make you wise and give unto you wisdom and understanding. I carefully observed what I was told by my guide and proceeded a short distance. I came to the box. I immediately took it up and placed it under my left arm. Then with eagerness I raised the lid and began to taste of its contents, upon which all manner of beasts, horned cattle, and roaring animals rose up on every side and in the most threatening manner possible, tearing the earth, tossing their horns, and bellowing most terrifically all around me. And they finally came so close upon me that I was compelled to drop the box and fly for my life. Yet in the midst of all of this, I was perfectly happy, though I awoke trembling. Now I invite you to come forward. The year is 1829, February of that year. Uh, Joseph Sr. and uh, his uh, companion, Lucy Mack, have traveled from uh, Palmyra down to Harmony to visit with uh, Joseph and Emma, very anxious about uh, the translation and whether the Yerman Thummim had been uh, returned. In that context, and in their joy to discover it had, and that the translation was going forward, Joseph Sr. asks of his son a blessing. And so uh, Joseph uh, Jr. uses the Urim and Thummim to receive a revelation for his father. You and I know it today as section four of the Doctrine and Covenants. It's a great revelation on service. I don't think any group of missionaries ever get together in our day and age that uh, in the form of a meeting that they don't stand and quote this particular section. That was certainly uh, the uh, case when I was a mission president. I don't know where that tradition comes from. I think it may well come from my grandfather Smith because I remember when I was a young missionary in the mission uh, training center uh, he had talked to us and told us that we should read that section each week of our missions. Now, uh, since the missionaries have quoted it so often, they think they own it. They don't own it. It belongs to my great-great-grandfather. And I'm authorized in behalf of the family to share it with you. It is also your revelation. It is a revelation that was intended to bless all the faithful members of the church in whatever capacity they were called to serve. I take you forward in time. The year now is 1834 to read one sentence that falls from the lips of Joseph Smith, Sr. <clears throat> the Lord, he said, has often visited me in visions and dreams. What a remarkable statement. What a marvelous thing it would be if you and I were so living that we could say, the Lord has often visited me in visions and dreams. We leave Father and Mother Smith and turn our attention now to uh, the family. I take you back again to May of 1829, while Joseph is laboring on the translation of the Book of Mormon. His uh, kid brother Samuel comes down, I think it was for the second time while he was involved in that labor. But in this instance, he comes at a point in time after 
John the Baptist has come to restore the authority to baptize. Joseph and Oliver take up the labor to uh, teach Samuel, to uh, attempt to persuade him of the necessity of his so ordering his life that he can be baptized and being involved in this work. Samuel is resistant. He is skeptical. We read as follows. He was not, however, very easily persuaded of these things, but after much inquiry and explanation, he retired to the woods. One would wonder where he got such an idea. In order that by secret and fervent prayer he might obtain of a merciful God wisdom to enable him to judge for himself. The result was that he obtained revelation for himself sufficient to convince him of the truth of our assertions to him. And on the 25th day of that same month in which we had been baptized and ordained, Oliver baptized him. And he returned to his father's house greatly glorifying and praising God, being filled with the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> that same month, Joseph's older brother, Hiram, comes down and in like manner inquires of his uh, brother uh, for a revelation. That revelation is uh, recorded for us in the 11th section of the Doctrine and Covenants and contains marvelous instruction on the very principle of revelation itself. Let us review a few of its uh, very instructive verses. Follow with me, if you will, commencing with the 12th verse. And now, verily, verily, I say unto thee, the Lord speaking to Hiram, but this is also my revelation and yours. Put your trust in that spirit which leadeth to do good, yea, to do justly, to walk humbly, to, to judge righteously. And this is my spirit. Now, there's a wonderful profile of the spirit so that we can always identify it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I will impart unto you of my spirit, which shall enlighten your mind, which shall fill your soul with joy, and then shall ye know, or by this shall ye know, all things whatsoever you desire of me, which are pertaining unto things of righteousness, in faith, believing in me, that you shall receive. So there's the standard by which we can test or measure all the uh, impressions that we have to assure that they indeed come from uh, the Spirit. Now, uh, Hiram was as pure and good a man as ever walked the face of the earth. And he volunteered his services to uh, labor in the uh, kingdom. And it has to be of some interest that the Lord said, no. No, Hiram, you can't be of much help to me. Now consider this uh, revelation given to Hiram. And to the extent that it applies to uh, you, then adopt it. Seek not to declare my word, but seek first to obtain my word. And then shall your tongue be loose. Then if you desire, you shall have my spirit and my word, yea, the power of God unto the convincing of men. But now hold your peace. Study my word which hath gone forth among the children of men. That, of course, would be the Bible. And also study my word which shall, shall come forth among the children of men. That would be the Book of Mormon or that which is now translating, yea, until you have obtained all which I shall grant unto the children of men in this generation, and then shall all things be added thereunto. Now, that is to say, Hiram, I love you, <clears throat> but you can't teach what you don't know any more than you can come back from where you have not been. Bless your heart. We have gospel doctrine uh, teachers every Sunday that try to disprove that principle. But none of them have ever been successful in doing it. You simply can't teach what you don't know. Behold thou art Hiram, my son. 
Oh, that sounds good, my son. Seek the kingdom of God. All things shall be added according to that which is just. Build upon my rock, which is my gospel. Deny not the spirit of revelation, nor the spirit of prophecy. For woe unto him that denieth these things. Now I take you forward in time. <clears throat> the year is 1838. We're with uh, Samuel once again. The setting of this story is the uh, uh, aftermath of the uh, Battle of Crooked River, uh, in which uh, there was some bloodshed. And some of the brethren found it uh, necessary to uh, retreat in a manner that would preserve their lives. Uh, Samuel would be one such. He was in company with Charles C. Rich, Benjamin Clapp, Lorenzo Young, he said, and about 20 others, they fled from uh, Illinois by the wilderness through the northern part of Missouri and the southern part of Iowa. Messengers overtook them and informed them that General Clark had sent a company of 50 well-armed men to follow them with strict orders not to return until they had brought back the company either dead or alive. When this, word when this word came, a halt was called, and Samuel asked what they should do in case the enemy overtook them. After a few moments of consul consultation, the whole company covenanted with uplifted hands that if they were overtaken, they would fight till they died, and not a man would fall into the hands of the enemy. They then traveled on 10 miles and camped on the edge of some timber on the north side of a four-mile prairie. And they afterwards learned that their enemy camped on the south edge of the same prairie and would have overtaken them the next day had the Lord not sent a heavy snowstorm during the night. And when the brethren arose in the morning, Phineas Young remarked that, he, that the snowstorm was their salvation. The air was so full of snow they could hardly find their horses and able to saddle them. But they soon mounted and continued their journey as fast as they could. The snow was from the north and in their faces. Thus it filled their tracks in just a matter of moments so that Clark's men could not follow. <clears throat> it was reported that this company of men on their return informed the general that they could not overtake the Mormons for the snow had stopped them. After they got some distance on their journey, the, camp, the company divided into three parts. The three brethren named fell in company with Samuel. Their provisions gave out. And after spending uh, several days without uh, food, except to eating uh, linden bug, buds and slippery elm bark, they camped upon a small stream. And the company, numbering eight, held a council, appointing Samuel president, that they might receive the word of Lord, the Lord in relation to Joseph and those that were with him, also in relation to their families, and what they were to do to obtain food. Now, there's some spiritual confidence involved here and certainly a manifestation of some respect for Samuel. They all knelt down in a circle. Each one prayed. And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samuel. And being filled with the Holy Ghost, he stood and said, Thus saith the Lord, My servant Joseph is not injured, nor any of his brethren that are with him. But they will be delivered out of the hands of their enemies. Your families are all well, but anxious about you. Let your hearts be comforted, for I, the Lord, will provide food for you on the morrow. They went to bed with glad hearts and arose in the morning and prayed again and went out two by two to hunt for food. Brother Clapp saw several squirrels and shot at them, but could not hit one. They were only to stay one hour. At the end of that time, they all returned except to Charles Rich and Samuel. <clears throat> Feeling very faint, one of the brethren proposed killing a horse. Brother Clapp said that when Brothers Rich and Samuel returned, they would have food. 
as he never knew the Lord to give a false revelation to his servants. And while conversing upon the matter, the brethren made their appearance with two silk handkerchiefs tied up full of bread and dried meat. Samuel's mind was led in a certain direction, and following it, they came to an Indian camp. They made known to the Indians by signs that they were hungry, in response to which an Indian woman, with all possible speed, baked them some cakes and gave each of them two, sending two to each of the six brethren in the camp, giving them to understand that she would be glad to send more. But she had to but little flour, and her papooses would be hungry. Now uh, I call your attention to an experience that Father Smith uh, has with his uh, son, Don Carlos. Father Smith had given his youngest son a patriarchal blessing, but it had not been fully recorded. Our account reads as follows. When I bless thee, thy blessing was never written. And I could not get it done, but now I want you to get my book, which contains the blessings of my family. Take your pen and fill out all those parts of your blessing which were not written. You shall have the Spirit of the Lord and be able to fill up all the vacancies which were left by Oliver when he recorded it. Now, that is certainly a manifestation of some spiritual confidence of the Father in the Son. On one occasion, Joseph Smith Sr. told someone to whom he had given a patriarchal blessing that, quote, if I have not promised blessings enough upon your head and stated enough in the blessing I have given you, sit down and write every good thing you can think of and every good thing your neighbor can think of and put all that into your blessing. And I will sign it and promise the whole to you if you will live for it. Now that's a great principle, and that's related to the principle that uh, the blessings that uh, have been given to our fathers are conveyed to us if we get their hearts and if we live worthy of them. Now uh, I want to turn to another member of the Smith family, the uh, oldest boy, Alvin. He died in 1823. He died before uh, <coughs> the gospel was restored. But he was uh, quite aware of uh, the appearance of Moroni and the promise of the translation of that marvelous record. In 1836, the 21st of January of that year, this would just be a few months before the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Well, Joseph, with his father and others, sit in the upper room of the Kirtland Temple in uh, a meeting in which uh, they were uh, being washed and anointed, had this vision open to uh, his eyes. He first uh, gave us a remarkable description of uh, the Christ, and then said, commencing in the fifth verse of this revelation, I saw Father Adam and Abraham and my father and mother, my brother Alvin, that has long since slept, and marveled how it was that he'd obtained an inheritance in that kingdom, seeing that he'd departed this life before the Lord had set his hand to gather Israel the second time, and had not been baptized for the remission of sins. Now note what's taking place in this vision. First of all, Joseph sees his own father and mother, and yet they're still living. And so he's quite conscious that this revelation is uh, of something yet to be. It is of something future. But what he can't understand is uh, Alvin's presence in the vision, because Alvin is seated here, or seen here rather, in the presence of uh, uh, heavenly company, and had died before he'd been able to be baptized. This is the kind of question that you would ask if you saw a revelation, you saw one of your uh, brothers or sisters in it, and your first question would be, how in the world did you get there? Uh, I know that that uh, would be the question <laughs> uh, uh, on the minds of uh, one of my brothers or sisters, should they have such a vision and see me in it, which would raise the question, why Alvin gets the leading role in the vision? Why the Smith boys get uh, the leading roles in these kind of visions? The answer would obviously be in part because those with the Smith blood are just a little better looking than the rest of you. 
and make me a better vision. But uh, <clears throat> there's more to it in this instance. What's going to happen here is this. For the first time in this dispensation, the Lord's going to uh, reveal the principles upon which uh, the gospel will be taught in the world of the spirits and people will be able to accept it unto salvation. And so the Lord says, or the prophet records, thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. Also all that shall die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts shall be heirs of that kingdom. So again, the principles go back to lodge in the designs and desires of our hearts. But Alvin is uh, given the leading role simply because he's the perfect illustration of the principles involved, at least in the experience and association of uh, the prophet. Despite his youth, Alvin was a man of unusual spiritual propensity. Before his death, he called each of his brothers and sisters in turn to his bedside and gave them a parting, a parting admonition. To his 18-year-old brother Joseph, he said, I want you to be a good boy and do everything that lies in your power to obtain the record, having obvious reference to the Book of Mormon. Be faithful in receiving instruction and in keeping every commandment that is given you. Mother Smith stated that Alvin manifest, if such could be the case, greater zeal and anxiety in regard to the record that had been shown to Joseph than any of the rest of the family, in consequence of which she said, we could not bear to hear anything said upon the subject. Whenever Joseph spoke of it, uh, the, and with all, the record, it would immediately bring Alvin to our minds with all his zeal and with all his kindness. And when we look to his place and realize that he was gone from it to return no more in this life, we all with one accord wept over our irretrievable loss and we could not be comforted because he was not. Nearly 20 years later, Joseph recounted his feelings at uh, the time of Alvin's death saying, I remember well the pangs of sorrow that swelled my youthful bosom and almost burst my tender heart when he died. He was the oldest and the noblest of my father's family. He lived without spot from the time he was a child. He was one of the soberest of men and when he died, the angel of the Lord visited him in his last moments. Now I take you to the year 1833 and the occasion when Joseph Smith laid his hands on his father's head and restored the office of patriarch for the first time in this dispensation and gave his father a patriarchal blessing. In that blessing, what uh, Joseph did was to uh, take the blessing recorded in the 49th chapter of Genesis that had been given to Joseph of Egypt by his father and just lifted it up and placed it, to, or uh, jo the Joseph of Egypt had placed on his son Joseph. Excuse me, Jacob had placed on Joseph. Joseph Smith takes that blessing and just places it on the head of his own father and makes it his. And then uh, what he did was to give him a uh, revelation about his place and standing among the patriarchs that uh, has uh, since been uh, institutionalized and constitutes part of the 107th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. You can read that part of Joseph Smith Sr.'s patriarchal blessing between verses 53 and 55. Thereafter, Joseph Smith Sr. in turn <clears throat> lays his hand upon his son's head and gives to him a blessing. 
and conveys the blessing of Joseph of Egypt upon his son and says, among other things, the following, Behold he, having reference to Joseph of Egypt, looked after his posterity in the last days when they should be scattered and driven by the Gentiles and wept before the Lord. He sought diligently to know from whence the Son should come, who should bring forth the word of the Lord, by which they might be enlightened and brought back to the true fold, and his eyes beheld thee, my son. His heart rejoiced, and his soul was satisfied, and he said, As my blessings are to extend to the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills, as my Father's blessings prevailed over the blessings of his progenitors, and as my branches are to run over the wall and my seed are to inherit the choice land whereon Zion, the Zion of God shall stand in the last days, from among my seeds scattered with the Gentiles shall a choice seer arise, whose bowels shall be a fountain of truth, whose loins shall be girdled with the girdle of righteousness, whose hands shall be lifted with acceptance before the God of Jacob, to turn away his anger from his anointed, whose heart shall mediate great wisdom, whose intelligence shall circumscribe and comprehend the deep things of God, and whose mouth shall utter the law of the, jo the just, and he shall feed upon the heritage of his father Jacob. Thou, Joseph Smith, Jr., shall hold the keys of this ministry, even the presidency of this church, both in time and in eternity. And thou shalt stand on Mount Zion when the tribes of Jacob come shouting from the north and with thy brethren the sons of Ephraim crown them in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, I leave that story. I take you to Kirtland. The year is 1837. Hiram has lost his beloved wife and companion and has a number of little children to provide for. His brother Joseph said, Hiram, <clears throat> it is the will of the Lord that you marry. And then, interestingly enough, he announced who it was who Hiram was to marry. You are to take as wife Mary Fielding. And so for his everlasting blessing and that of the Smith family, Hiram proposes to Mary Fielding, and she accepts. I don't know what he said in the proposal, but uh, she became his companion, and her story is well known to you. And on another occasion, in conversation with his brother and Joseph, said, quote, I never knew Hiram to say he had a revelation, and it failed. And so it was when the brethren uh, fled to uh, Nauvoo and crossed the river and then paused to uh, evaluate their course and determine what they should do. Joseph turns to Rockwell, Oren Porter, and he says, what shall we do? Port replies, Joseph, you're the oldest. You ought to know best. And as you make your bed, I will lie with you. He then turns to Hiram who was talking with Cahoon, he said to Brother Hiram, you are the oldest, what shall we do? And Hiram said, let us go back and give ourselves up and see the thing out. And so it was. Now when Robert B. Thompson spoke at the funeral of Father Smith, he said, quote, the whole church will copy his examples. Walk in his footsteps steps, and emulate his faith and his virtuous actions, end of quote. In a marvelous farewell letter to his family, Joseph's grandfather, Asel Smith, gave direction to his children that when he died, they were to bury all of his faults with him. And as to his virtues, they were to keep them alive and pass them from generation to generation. Now in it all, there are some great lessons that we can learn. One, <clears throat> the gospel applies alike to all. 
Through faith and obedience, all families can be directed by the spirit of revelation. Two, revelation will never substitute for obedience. Three, it is for fathers to bless their sons and sons to bless their fathers. In the book of James, where we are told that the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, so it is with the prayer of a righteous mother. And then the pattern of faith found in the fathers and mothers finds its image and its likeness in their children and their children's children. Now, such is the path that the Smith family trod. Such is the path that you and I ought trod. With the perfect knowledge and assurance again that when the hearts of the children turn to the fathers, the hearts of the fathers will turn to the children and they will convey the blessings given to them to uh, the same, to those of the same heart and they truly will become the children of their fathers. May such be your lot and mine, for the principles are true. I so attest in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This address by Dr. Joseph F. McConkie was given at the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium at Brigham Young University on October 29, 2005.